Well, we are live right now, I believe, um, on the internet. Um, <laughs> Cause I was told we were, but we're not. <laughs> now we are. Now we're live. <laughs> Perfect. I'm like, what do we do? Father Josh, am I hosting? Are you hosting? You got it. What's happening? <laughs> um, well, I just want to introduce myself. This is uh, YouTube and my name is Father Mike Schmitz. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Duluth up in Minnesota. And uh, this afternoon, uh, whenever you're watching this, uh, if you're watching this live with us, um, I'm being joined by my brother, uh, Father Josh Johnson from the Diocese of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I come from the uh, beginning of the Mississippi River and he comes from near the end of the Mississippi River. Itself. And uh, <laughs> Father Josh, thank you a ton for, for, well, thank you a ton for you and for all the things that you do in your ministry and all the things that you do, not only for your parish, which is just like blows my mind, um, but all the things you do online and uh, your podcast and what you're doing here with Ascension. Um, so first of all, just thank you. And, and thank you, Father Mike, because you've always been a, a good older brother and a good friend to me and uh, and just a great witness. Um, at, a lot of people. So like at, when we speak at conferences, sometimes you meet people and they have a charisma of speaking, but off stage they're like, they're a jerk. <laughs> and they're not too nice. Uh, that's not you. Like you are a genuinely good dude and uh, um, you strive to be an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's, it's a great gift for me. Um, I'm grateful to, to have known you, um, not only on stage, but off stage as well, because you are a, an authentic disciple of Jesus. That, that thank you for the, that. That means a lot because I'm like, I am more comfortable kind of sometimes giving the talk than I am kind of just like just having a talk sometimes, you know? That's oh, no, kind of I'm an introvert. So I can give yeah, a talk same. to thousands of people and I'm, I'm totally fine. But if you want like off stage, if there's no boundaries, I'm, I'm so exhausted so quick. So, yeah, same thing. I think we might have had this conversation before. We because, did. Um, uh, well, I embarrassed at, you in the elevator. Remember the time in the elevator I embarrassed yes. you on purpose? Yeah. And I was like, he must do this all the time. I was <laughs> thinking about this earlier because last night I listened to the your, your conversation with Jeff Cavins on what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about really, I know we're starting off kind of light, but we're talking about a serious, serious issue that is prevalent in the world, in the church and in our own hearts um, of racism and um, the consequences of that in our life. But before we get into that, I think that it is helpful maybe to establish those who are going to be joining us or are joining us right now, that um, I think we have this mutual brotherhood and a mutual respect for each other. And I sometimes am in awe. And again, this is we're going to get into the content, but I just want to need to say this. Um, so when we first got to know each other, it was through a video that Ascension had made for a program called Alteration. And it was a promotional kind of vocational promotional thing called I Will Follow. And uh, so it highlighted me, highlighted you and the kind of these guys are priests and here we are. Um, two things about that. One is we talked about this, that afterwards people are like, oh, how long have you and Father Josh been friends? And yeah. I was like, we haven't yet met. Um, but then we did, it was like, okay, gosh, I'm just so grateful. Um, the second thing was, um, well, how, how long have you been ordained now? Uh, de deacon seven years, priest six years. Okay. So this video came out six years ago, essentially. Yeah. And yeah. I and I remember, like, I because I'm 16, 17 this year, I think. Yeah, because last year I could legally drive as a priest. Um, so in in three days, I'll be my my ordination anniversary. When's yours? Uh, May thirty first. Uh, just oh, passed it already it. Just passed it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you didn't you didn't call me. It's cool. I missed it. And no card in the mail. Yeah, nothing. Um, nothing. But uh, the sixth is my seventeenth year. So Sweet. I remember thinking. Um, wow, I've been ordained 11 years and here's Father Josh. He's only been ordained a couple of months. I hope he's okay with this. I hope he, I hope he doesn't like just go off the rails because right, yeah. of all this attention. And you have just, um, even though, again, there's a distance between us, not only of the entire Mississippi River, but also of you know 10 years of age and experience. I'm just like, I keep looking to you as here is a priest who not only knows the Lord himself, and not only loves people, even in spite of our being introverts, um, but has such a vision. And that vision keeps coming back mm. to Jesus. And that's one of the reasons why I think I wanted to mm. have this conversation with you, not just because you represent an African-American perspective um, on the racism we're experiencing from a, even as a priest, but also because the thing that strikes me every time you and I talk, every time you and I pray is you're always come back to this how does Jesus see this? Like, how does, how does, what does the Lord want us to do? How does he want me to move forward in your parish or in like, when we go on the road, like have speaking at, at conferences and stuff, you always just ground mm -hmm. me. You, I mean, when you speak like that, it grounds me and roots me more deeply in that, uh, 
that like, yeah, that's what I want too. And I can't, mm-hmm. I can find myself getting yeah. caught up in the news. I can find myself getting caught up yeah. in what people are talking about. And like, here's this person who seems really intelligent talking about th- whatever crisis in yep. particular, this is the current crisis yeah. that we're experiencing. I'm oh, sorry. I was say, is it safe to say a crisis been. that it's been revealed to the nation, yes. but it's been, a, it's been experienced by a significant years. portion of the nation for their entire lifetimes. Yes. And generations before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so we, the, the gospel, I mean, that's the po- whole point, right? We, we lean into the gospel because like, that's where the truth will be revealed to us of, of how the Lord Jesus Christ wants for us to respond to this situation. Like the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we're going to think like Jesus and speak like Jesus and see the world through the lens of Jesus's eyes and fill with his heart and then act with his body. And I do think Michael, like you're saying like sometimes, we get so caught up in in reading blogs and listening to podcasts, um, or watching videos. They, I mean, you should listen to our podcast. But uh, <laughs> but like we get so caught up in these these things that that can be helpful and that do have their they have their place. But I always go back to like if we're spending more time reading a blog or watching a documentary than we are reading the Bible, reading the sacred scriptures, even if it's a spiritual book, even if it's a writing of the saint, that's wrong. Because yeah. the word of God is the inspired word that Jesus Christ has given to us. And, and only his, his word and his sacraments, like only that is going to transform us to be able to respond to these situations that he has created us to respond to in this specific generation. Well, even that, he's created us to respond to this particular moment. Yeah, you um, and I, and, we all. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, you know, gosh, okay, th- this actually kicks us off because as we know, 10 days ago, now 10 days ago, Memorial Day, um, that uh george floyd was murdered and um and just the interrogation again here's a thing that gets it gets revealed um a, a thing a reality that so many people experience on a daily daily basis um but gets revealed to the entire nation um so one of the things that that as you're talking about like we see these things with the eyes of jesus um i'm thinking you know, as a priest a lot of times people would I just want to say this, lead this off right away. Say, somebody says, Father Mike, say something about this. And for me, I'm just thinking, um, originally, like, well, is it, what is there to, here? Maybe this is my first thing. I was like, oh, gosh, what is there to say other than everyone sees evil for what it is right now? Like, it seems mm-hmm. like evil's on display. Um, but in those kind of moments, I don't know what What would you say? Here's what I Here's what I need to see as say as a priest, like because because maybe we have some brother priests who are joining us today, and that's what they've been thinking. Like maybe they maybe they know, maybe they already have a clear vision of what the Lord wants to say through them and through their priesthood. Um, but even just as Catholics, whether we're uh, ministerial priests or just you know kingdom priests, like what does the Lord want us to say with regard to not just the the tragedy of George Floyd's death, his murder, mm. but racism in general. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Uh, I think that I perceive again, I I'm not infallible, so what? I could be wrong. Right. I know. Crazy. Right. I'm, I'm not sitting on the chair mind. right now. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. I'm sorry. We- <laughs> <laughs> Though the Holy spirit is like, check out my, you see my Holy spirit right here. It's, so yeah. no, I, I think that the Lord is inviting all of us in this time right now to, to intentionally like, listen, well, Mm-hmm. Right. To 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 listen first before we act, because sometimes there's an old African proverb and I, this is Holy Spirit moment. I pray because I was not planning on, on sharing this proverb, but there's an old African proverb where there were these like monkeys and they were in a forest and and there were these uh, a, a terrible rainstorm happened. And during the rainstorm, the, the animals were trying to, to get to higher ground and the monkeys saw these fish in the water and the fish looked like they were like struggling. And so the monkey said, oh, like, look at those poor, poor animals in the water. We need to go save them. Like they're struggling right now. They're jumping up and down. They need us. And so they just like jumped into the, to the, to the water and they picked the fish out of the water and they put them on ground and the fish were like flapping at first. And they were thinking like, oh, they must be trying to communicate to us that they're grateful for us saving their lives. And then after that, the fish stopped. And then they're like, well, maybe now they're just at, they're, they're resting because they were, they were, they were so scared. And now they're, they're at peace. And then all of a sudden, as the monkeys kept talking to each other, they said, wait a minute, something, something's wrong. I don't think they're sleeping. I think that those fish are dead. I, I think that we, we killed them uh, because the monkeys tried to act before like listening to the fish and asking them, okay, like tell me about your experience of being an animal that lives in the water. And like, do you, how can I accompany you right now? Like, what can I do for you? 
And so I think the same thing can apply for disciples of Jesus Christ, intentional disciples of Jesus Christ in the 21st century, faithful Catholics who are trying to respond to this situation today because we know that God created us in this time to respond in unique particular ways that will be different depending on how he's calling us to be a part of the body of Christ in that moment. But the Lord is inviting us no matter where, whether we're called to be intercessors, whether we're called to be activists, whether we're called to be writers, uh, whatever the, our role is um, in the body of Christ to respond to the evil sin of, of racism. Uh, I think the Lord first is inviting us to first go to people who have experienced this and and listen fast from speaking. I, I, people always ask me, Father Josh, what's a good penance I could do? What's a what's a good practice I can I, I could do, or what's a fast I can offer up? Uh, I give up alcohol. I give up a burger. Like I, I say, give up speaking. Give up speaking for a while. Like stop talking. God gave you, you and I two ears in one mouth, which I think the theology of the body would tell us that means that he wants us to listen more than we communicate, more than we talk. And so to intentionally begin to fast from speaking, to fast from maybe um, that which is, has become our echo chamber of of the only resources that we've ever leaned into, whether it's our favorite news station, our, our favorite books, our favorite podcasts, our favorite um, circles that we, we are inundating ourselves in, um, immersing ourselves in, and, and begin to intentionally listen to the voices of people who have experienced um, not only racial prejudice or, or racial discrimination, because anyone could experience racial prejudice or racial discrimination, but specifically people in this country who legally, um, through first the laws and now through, I say, practices and policies, practices being unwritten rules and policies being those written rules, continue to experience being alienated and discriminated against um, because of the rules um, and because of uh, those things. So I ask those questions. Hey, like I want to listen to you, but I also am going to do the homework and not just ask you to, to be my, my bearer of all my news, but I'm also going to go and start reading books that I may have never read before. I'm going to watch documentaries and listen to other podcasts that I may have never listened to before. I was telling you, Mike, earlier that one of the most profound experiences I, I have had in seminary formation uh, was whenever um, I, I had, I would say, professors that there was uh, some professors or professor, I won't say how many it was, that I just, I struggled with in that particular class. And uh, and every morning I would wake up and I'd go and spend an hour with Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. I'd do a holy hour, as Fulton Sheen calls it. And it was just a season of dryness, brother. Like it was so dry. I couldn't, I couldn't perceive what he was trying to communicate to me in the scripture. I, I couldn't perceive his presence. I knew he was there, but I just, it, it was just so dry. And at the same time, I was going to this class and I just didn't want to hear what these professors were saying because I disagree with them. And so I'd pray a rosary during class and I'd pray Divine Mercy Chaplet and I would do all these devotional prayers. And one day I was in spiritual direction and I told my spiritual director, my senior uh, Fitz, who's passed away. I said, my senior, you'll be so proud of me. Uh, this, this, these, these professors are, are so crazy. Uh, I, I prayed a rosary during their class so I wouldn't have to hear what they had to say. Um, and he said to me, he said, Josh, I'm so disappointed in you. How prideful have you become? They said, you are, you are listening to Satan right now. And I was, I was like, what? I'm praying a rosary. What are you talking right, about? Yeah. And he said, Josh, he said, you told me yourself, like for this past season of your life, every morning you wake up for an hour and you spend it with Jesus in the blessed sacrament and that it's been dry. He said, you can't perceive his voice. He said, what if God just wants to look at you in adoration and wants you to look at him? And what if God is inviting you to hear him speak to you through people you disagree with, people you don't think like, you don't look like, you don't act like? He said, what if God's trying to speak to you through them? He said, what I want you to do now is I want you to go to class and write down notes, very diligently take notes on everything they've said. And some stuff they say might be bad, right? But we can't throw the baby with the bathwater. He said, and after you write notes what they said, I want you to apply the steps of Lexio Divina to what they've said. Read it. What does it say? Meditate on it. What does it say to me? Then pray, have a conversation with Jesus about what they said says to you and then sit with the Lord. And I kid you not, I began to do this and all of a sudden the dryness went away. I was able to perceive the voice of God speak to me through these, these two people who I really struggled with because we were so different. And But because I fasted from doing what I wanted to do and I actually listened well, I was able to not only hear them, but I was able to hear Jesus. And Jesus wants to speak to us through members of the body of Christ right now who are suffering, who've been suffering. Uh, and, and the only way we can hear them is if we like surrender and really open our hearts up to hear what they have to say so that we can accompany them in a way that is conducive for them and for all of us um, to thrive 
in our walk toward eternity and our journey to becoming the saints that God desires for us to be. If those monkeys would have listened to the fish, then they, they would have never just assumed that they knew what to do in that situation. So I would say, listen, listening is the, the first and most important thing. Well, prayer, but listening is what we could do all um, in this situation. Well, and I think you think you were saying that because one of the things that has been um, kind of, <laughs> it's, it's been a thing in like on social media where, where, uh, it's a place of sounding off, right? It's a place where people just speak and we rarely, and we react. We don't necessarily ingest. We don't necessarily take time to respond. Yeah. Not sure how many people pray before they tweet or before they post. And, but it's been one of those mantras that's come back. Like, okay, this is a season of listening, listen and learn, like yeah. listen and learn. Um, but you had a really key word. Uh, well, you just said a bunch of stuff that I was like, Oh my gosh, I need to write this down, but I don't want to look like I'm writing stuff. Um, where you know it and you said, surrender, I have to surrender. And there was something about even like to take the, that experience you had in seminary of like, no, I mean, what they're saying is clearly wrong. Like, I don't need anyone to tell me that. I know it already because of what I've been, how I've been formed. And yeah. I'm not doing something evil with it at uh, that time. I'm not skipping class. I'm not causing a ruckus. You're, we didn't do what I did when I had teachers I disagreed with. I just argued with them. Um, <laughs> You're praying. Like, he's like, no, I'm talking to the Lord now instead of yeah. listening to this person. <laughs> so what's the key thing in there? I had to surrender. Mm. And I, I think of the way in which I know my mind is often shaped by, um, like you had said, the, the podcast we listen to, the books we read, the people we, who's our go-to source of information. Yeah. Um, and we go to those places because we trust them to a certain degree, right? They've, they've, they've established some credibility for us. And so, yeah, we have to learn more. And I, I need to go to certain places that I know have at least a reliable source of information where I can get some data. Even if I also know that I'm not just getting data, I'm getting their interpretation of the data. Yeah. Um, but then to be able to say, just because here's their, here's the data, or here's the interpretation of the data, that doesn't necessarily mean that that data is being looked at with the mind and the vision of Jesus. Yes. Um, I know that for myself, like I get that happens all of the time where mm. like, wow, that was awesome. That's a great point. And that's true. And I'd like, you know, kind of like it, well, it might be, I want to say factually true. It might be, uh, the data might be true, but impartial, the data mm. might be true, but the interpretation could be off. And I can only get down to the, the core of it. If I surrender, like, oh, I subscribe or subscribe to this particular person's take and say, but Jesus, and that's why I love, like, you hear of this surrender. Okay, I could be wrong. You know, I, I have to, like, let go of my ego, my pride, what I think is, like, absolutely true. I need to listen in order to learn. And then how you just, gosh, I don't want to just recap what you just said. But <laughs> but it's it's a whole part, piece where you took it to prayer and to, said, to the Lord, um, yeah, Lord. It's not, like, just automatically they're right now. It's what here, I mean, I imagine you're learning not only about the topic. But you're also learning about yourself. Yeah. Like I was hesitant and resistant to this, but actually, Lord, through your eyes, hmm. maybe, maybe there's truth here. Or or yeah. like I thought this was true, but like, oh now, Lord, I realize, but that's not how you would see it. Yeah. And I think that ah, that's so, so powerful. So here's one of the things that I've I've experienced when it comes to um you know, because I was talking with, I, we, I mentioned to you before, I was speaking with one of our, our students. She's a young black woman. Yeah. Um, so grateful for her. I mean, she's just super faithful. And one of the things she had said was she said, um, she's, a, she's a graduate student now. So she's been on campus for four years plus, maybe five now. And um, super faithful, and uh, but just honest. You know, she's really intelligent and really just, I was so honored that she would be willing to even just speak to me and, and tell me what she where she was at. One of the things she said is she says, our church has such incredible Catholic social teaching. Now, it doesn't always have incredible Catholic social practice, but like the, right. the teaching, the, the the theology behind it is like really, I mean, it's, it's, it's I think it's relatively pretty good. But she said, yeah, right. I don't ever hear that uh, in the parishes. Like She's like, I can go online because she's very intelligent She's and she's uh, driven. I go online, I can read this and it's mm -hmm. amazing. It always moves my heart and always moves, informs my mind. But I never hear this in parishes. And I had to listen to this. And, you know, your, your initial response, maybe sometimes as a priest, is to kind of not justify or defend yourself, but to explain. Maybe, that's, mm -hmm. maybe it's the same thing. But yeah. I'm thinking like, oh, here's my perspective. Because she's like, Father Mike, I've been on campus for, you know, five years, six years now. You've never 
preached on racism as a sin, as an evil. Mm. And, and I was like, okay, I, what do I say with this? My thought, initial thought was, well, it's because everyone knows that's evil. And, and you know, as a preacher, you don't preach on something everyone already knows is evil. You, I wouldn't have a homily on you guys. We have to stop stealing stuff. It's just stop stealing. Like, well, mm. everyone knows theft is wrong. But she was like, no, not everyone knows this. And right. not everyone knows how, how diabolically evil. Again, you and Jeff last night talked about this, how diabolically mm. evil, like from Satan, mm. how diabolically evil racism is. And I just thought, wow, what, how much more I need to listen, how much more I need to learn in order to be able to act. I don't know if, does that resonate at all? Or yeah, no, I mean, that, and that's the whole point is that we, we first, we, we stop and we fast, <laughs> we practice fasting so we can listen, so we can learn. And then once we learn, we ask the other, like, how can, how can we act together? Like, what's your wisdom? How can I walk with you? How can I accompany you? Um, because otherwise we're not going to know what's going on unless we're constantly in relationship with our bride. You know, like a husband can't love his, his wife well, unless he's asking her, like, what's going on in your heart? Like, tell yeah. me what's going on. Like, I need to know what do I, what am I doing that you like? What am I doing that you don't like? What's, what's good for you? As a pastor, one, a, a sister told me whenever I was first ordained, she said, make sure your bride knows that she's beautiful. Like get to know her and be able to like communicate her beauty to her in a way that she can receive it, right? I mean, obviously, as a priest, I go up to a woman and be like, "Dang, girl, you beautiful." You know? But <laughs> not how you do it. Okay, gotcha. It's not how you do it, but to like lean into the relationship with the person, right? Which is like where we have to be right. intentional with people um, in our in our parish with every person, and that's again a point that I made last night with Jeff is that as priests, we are responsible for every single person who lives in our geographical boundaries, and I think one of the problems. Um, with this topic is that um, sometimes uh, priests get sent to a parish and they only minister to the people who are showing up, but yeah. not the people who live in the geographical boundaries who might not be showing up because when they did show up to that particular parish, they were, they were turned away or they were excluded uh, or they were insulted because of the priest homily, because he never engaged them to find out like how some things he may be saying might not, not actually be good. Uh, I mean, I have, I've had people join my parish because of things that other priests have said. They're like, Father, we just couldn't take it anymore. Um, and we, they, they, they were sure Father wasn't trying to be intentionally um, insulting, but he kept saying things um, that people of color were like, that's not okay. You know, so they yeah. just left and came here. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that we are responsible for the salvation of every soul, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Hindu, Jew, black, white, Latino, Asian, indigenous, male, female, like every person we are invited by the Holy spirit to like imitate Jesus Christ and go out and, and encounter them where they're at on their turf uh, and, and to go meet them where they're at so that we can find out how can I invite you to the joy of the gospel? How can I walk with you? And, and how can I work with you to to maybe right some wrongs? Like there, uh, Archbishop Hughes did the most beautiful thing when he was the Archbishop of New Orleans, Louisiana. It's like the most beautiful thing. So he, first of all, is a saintly man. Uh, he's a teacher in the seminary. He's retired. And he wakes up like at 3 a.m. in the morning, spends like three hours with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, he's just the, the holiest old man ever. I, I love him to death. But whenever he was the Archbishop of New Orleans, the active Archbishop, he noticed that a number of African Americans were leaving their parishes. And so he invited them to the table so he can listen to them, right? To find out what's going on in my archdiocese that I don't know about because I don't know where my people are leaving their parishes. And they began to tell him, like, well, Archbishop, you know, like our, our pastors and our parishes are hosting events at this particular country club. And this particular country club has a practice where they don't allow black membership. Do you know how it feels that we tithe to this parish and we have been members of this parish our whole life and we are active in ministry and we give everything to this parish. And then our parish, after we have told them that we don't think it's a good idea for them to host an, an event there, they keep doing it. We're, we're just tired of that, Archbishop. We, we, we are tired of, of, of our pastors and our church leaders not standing up and saying, you know what, we're not going to support a country club that has white only membership still. Um, and so what Archbishop Hughes did was he wrote a pastoral letter against racism. And whenever he wrote this pastor letter against racism, the, a lot of Catholics, because the archbishop made it clear that no Catholic church, institution, school, hospital could hold any event there at any um, place that does not allow diverse membership, they began to lose money. When they lost money, um, they changed their practice and they began to invite black people to be members. <laughs> but what that did for the black Catholics in his archdiocese, some of whom were on the way out of the church, is yeah. it, it made them feel like, okay, 
our church cares about us. Our church was invested. Our church noticed that we weren't here, that we weren't in the pews, that we weren't in the Bible studies, that we weren't at the table. And our church came to us, invited us to the table and asked us what was going on. And then just assume, then just say, look, I know theology. I've read theology of the body. I know John Paul II. I know the Bible. I know the catechism. This is what you need. No, instead of coming from that, that, that place of, I know everything, that he came from a position of, I want to learn how I can love you better in your walk toward becoming a saint and, and keep you in the sacraments of life of the Catholic church. And, and that has happened time and time again. I've seen with other leaders who finally just took time to be with the people and their boundaries and listen to them and hear how there are still um, these, these things going on that they weren't aware of because it never affected them because their family growing up was always able to go to certain places and participate in certain events. Um, and they never experienced uh, certain things. So they didn't know that they were happening until they leaned into relationship intentionally, consistently and listened well, and then acted um, after all of those things preceded the action. Yeah, it makes so much sense to me because I just would say that, you know, we only have our own perspective. We only know what we know. Yeah. And, and there's that, that piece of, um, I guess you could say that they, fine, that's great. I only know what I know, but then that becomes the only lens I can look at life through. Mm -hmm. um, and I know for my, myself, again, same kind of situation where I'm like, well, I'm in Northern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Um, it was founded or is colon not founded. It was not founded. They were indigenous people of the Anishinaabe. We're yeah. here, the Ojibwe. Um, uh, but then colonized it by, uh, the, uh, Finnish people and Norwegian people and German people. And I, I Irish got here and I'm one quarter of almost all of those. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I am in a, in a, I'm surrounded by people who look like me, essentially, I would say like this. Yeah. Um, and that affects my lens, right? That, that affects yes. how I see myself. That affects how I see my sense of belonging. That affects how I would even interpret someone's, um, if someone's nice to me, it affects how I interpret that. Mm. If someone is rude to me, that affects how I interpret that. Um, I remember talking to, uh, I think he's probably a mutual friend of ours. Um, and uh, he's a black man who's a musician. And he had talked about going back to, or going to where his family's from, Nigeria, uh, for the first time. I think it was Nigeria. Maybe it was uh, one of the Caribbean islands that had a large population of uh, black people. And he had said, he walked around and he said for the first time, he's like, why do I feel so different? What, what is it? And he's like, oh my gosh, I don't have that sense of like, I'm different. He says, I just, I, no one's looking at me as if I'm different. Yeah, man, uh, dude. I, yeah. And he just had this sense of freedom and he was like, I then, mm. so on the one hand, it was like the elation of like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And then there was that grief of that's the lens through which I've been shaped. Like that's the lens through which I do. That's how that's the lens through which I interpret this person's behavior, that person's behavior, and uh, even who I am as a person. So going back to this, um, like you're saying, we listen, we learn, because then our lens can get either we add lenses or we can be shaped. But I know for myself, like if I come into the conversation going like, no, no, no my my lens is is valid, and yours uh, is a version of my lens, like. I don't know. Let's, I have to set that aside and just yeah. receive it as, as much as possible, but I don't know. So here's, here's again, going back to my Northern Minnesota kind of thing. Uh, we have some cultural stuff. We have some, you and I have some cultural differences between Louisiana and Minnesota. One of them is you are willing to talk to anybody. And I'm like, they'd say this, they say like the outgoing Minnesotan uh, or an extroverted Minnesotan is the guy who looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. Um, <laughs> and I remember going out to eat with you and I'm like, we are talking to everybody here. Like this is, it's kind of fun because you get to, you got to drive the conversation. But, um, <laughs> but for the most part, like our, some cultural stuff is like, we kind of keep to ourselves. You don't talk about certain things. Yeah. And, um, and I grew up, we had, uh, we had people of color in my, in my uh, high school and in my school, I was pals with uh, people who were of Hispanic background or a native background, black. Um, and I always thought like, this is great. You know, we're all, we're all the same. And, and yeah. I never, I never brought up race because a, again, Minnesotan kind of, we just stay away from things that might be a little dicey. And yeah. B, my perspective is, I guess in some ways it'd be like, well, it's not an issue, not an issue for me. Cause I'm not, mm -hmm. cause I mean, this is the thing is cause I'm not racist. Um, yeah. And so, gosh, I don't know. Can you <laughs> help me on this one? Because especially as Minnesotans, oh, sorry, especially a certain kind of person that doesn't bring up stuff. Um, is it, is it rude? Is it, 
I don't know, is it is it risky to say, let's talk about race. Let's talk about racism. I think, I mean, Mike, I think we have to, man. Like, you, you cannot, so, like, we've acknowledged that we believe that there's a, a demonic stronghold. Yes. Like, this is a, a demonic attack that's been over this nation since the the Native Americans, Indigenous people were, were began to be slaughtered. Let's just call it what it, I, I think our language is very important. Like, we call plantations, oh, I'm going to this beautiful plantation. I'm like, no, that's a labor camp. That's a right. slave labor camp. Like, like, let's give it a different language, and it changes, like, the reality of what really happened there. It was like Black people were really happy to be people's slaves. And, yeah. um, and so I think that there's a, a demonic stronghold that if we don't name it, um, this is the charismatic coming out. We can't, yeah, name it, claim it, tame it, or whatever. But like, you can't beat an enemy that you haven't exposed to the light. Um, yeah. And so we have to do, like, like bring it up for the conversation. You know, like, I, I, I can't help somebody as a doctor if they don't tell me like what's going on. Uh, we can't. We have to like diagnose. This is what the issue is right here. You have cancer, and because now we know you have cancer, here's the treatment that we can go. Here, here's the path. But if we just say, uh, you know, this, you're sick, and you keep it vague. Um, then that's never going to be able to get down to the core of what's really going on. And we need to come together, I would say, as intentional disciples of Jesus Christ um, to, to pray and to fast, to, to listen more. It's important to, to collaborate together, to find like, like, what's your charism, Father Mike? What's my charism? And how can we use our charisms that we receive that baptism, those supernatural gifts um, in collaboration with each other? to do a number of things. Number one, to try to be used by God to help people find transformation in Christ, their hearts and minds transformed, their minds renewed upon the mind of Christ, filled with the sacred heart of Jesus Christ. But also at the same time, it's the both and approach. The Catholic both and approach is always, we need to look at the laws. We need to look at, are there still laws that might be accommodating white people in this country? Because this country was founded on laws to accommodate white people. Um, and to alienate and discriminate black people from the institution of slavery to Jim Crow, to the redlining that happened, um, to uh, the the um, ho the Homestead Act, where the land that was promised to black people was then not given to them and given to, to white people, um, which, of course, with land comes power to to so many things. I mean, like r right now where you have s s really ridiculous rules that even really nice Catholics put together because they don't invite black people to sit at the table with them and their mm -hmm. parishes are in their schools that again, continue to like to keep them away from the sacraments, which are salvific, the sacraments, which bring us into the life of the Trinity that we are going to celebrate this upcoming weekend, the sacraments of salvation. So there's so many things that we need to address, but like we need to be able to come together and say, how can we collaborate together to even not only try to help people to fall in love with Jesus so their minds and hearts are, are restored, but also so that we can work together to make sure that there aren't laws that can corrupt holy hearts. Uh, yeah. what, an example I like to use a lot is whenever I was a kid, people used to smoke a lot in restaurants. They used to smoke a lot and it stunk, you know, whatever. Um, and we were taught growing up about the dangers of cigarettes. There were commercial ads all the time about if you smoke cigarettes, then, you know, you're going to whatever X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Eventually, because we grew up hearing about how dangerous cigarettes were, people in our generation ended up writing new laws that prohibited cigarettes from being allowed to be smoked in restaurants, in public places. Or they, you have to go to a separate space in a restaurant. You can't just do it anywhere. To the point where now, if you or I go to a restaurant and we see somebody smoking a cigarette, we're or in class or whatever, we're going to we're gonna probably, we're going to feel a certain way about it. Our hearts are going to be convicted about that. And we probably will say something because the law has really informed us on that. Um, right. And so we need to work on getting people to Jesus so that Jesus in the scriptures and the sacraments and community and, and scripture studies and fellowship, et cetera, and study, Jesus can reform our hearts and minds. But then we as the body of Christ also have to make sure that the law as well won't come around and really mess up some good hearts and, and corrupt them to begin to believe things that aren't actually good um, and true and beautiful, as Thomas would say. Well, and you had mentioned, uh, so I, I remember uh, hearing someone talking about like, in our families, we have rules and we have unwritten rules. Um, and uh, and sometimes you need someone to come in from the outside who is like, oh, that's I didn't realize that was a rule. And you yeah. like, inside of the family like, oh, oh, my gosh. I, yeah. I also I didn't realize. So I remember asking you about this. Uh, it must, it was, I think it was at uh, SLS. Um, Probably. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Something. And, and, and uh, 
I was like, so what are some of those things? And you had this term you could call policies and practices. Yeah. So, so practices that are in place that like, mm -hmm. uh, because here's what here I'm coming from. Again, I'm just going to say like, you know, Northern Minnesota, not a lot of like my lens is a certain lens. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, that, I'm not leaning on that crutch. I just mean it as like a description of that informs a lot of what I, and so I'm thinking, wait, what laws, what are you talking about when yeah. it comes to like, I thought, uh, not only slavery illegal, but Jim Crow illegal and yeah. But, but you, yeah. So there are, there are practices and policies, some of which were intentional and some are unintentional. The unintentional ones are written by good people who had a good heart and they tried to do a good thing and they unknowingly put something in place that's going to hurt people and have a negative effect on people. But there were some that were, we have to remember like when the civil rights act happened, um, after Jim Crow, it wasn't like the Civil Rights Act happened and all those people who were in power all of a sudden had conversions and became disciples of Jesus Christ and loved the Lord and were like, we want salvation for everybody. We want a just society. We want everyone to experience equity and equality and whatever. No, like the people, they, they were upset. Many people were like, oh man, like shoot, we lost this battle. So how can we continue to perpetuate division? And so one of the ways that they were able to do that uh, people in leadership was through practices and policies practices those unwritten rules policies are those written rules and this is like and this is what institutional I, I know it's like a controversial word for some people they're like um institutional racism doesn't exist here's what it is institutional racism is manifested in those practices and policies that accommodate some people give access to some people and deny access to others alienate others and discriminate against others examples following are some examples um and, and practices are, are difficult because you can always justify them and say, well, that's, that's not what we mean. rules of the family, right? I yeah. So it's, it's stuff like this. Like there's a, a swimming pool in Louisiana right now, a swimming pool in Louisiana that is still segregated, white, white membership only. Um, and it, they get away with it because they say we accept the application of everybody. And we've since they were founded um, after Jim Crow, they've accepted the application of everybody. But they only or they they will receive it, but they would then only allow the white applications to pass through. Oh, wow. So a black person can apply in, and for the past fifty years or whatever it's been, sixty years, not one black person has ever been admitted as a member, and they've been able to justify by saying there's no rule that we're saying we're denying black people. Um, Mardi Gras balls were started. A, a lot of Mardi Gras balls began this way because Mardi Gras crews in New Orleans weren't able to ride anymore, segregated. And so they began, a lot of people began to do Mardi Gras balls, which some are really cool and they're nice and they're fun. They're holy and they're wholesome and they're integrated. But others were specifically started because it was, it was people's way of saying, I want to have my own club where you can't get in if you apply. Only white people can be members. There's still frats maybe on your campus. I know at LSU, I know in, in Alabama, there's fraternities um, like the KAs who they have the practice um, of only accepting white guys as 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 um, frat, frat guys and sorority is the same thing. Um, so the list goes on and on. And, and then policies, uh, there's a, a school in Baton Rouge. It's, it's actually, and this is a wonderful story of how easy it is to bring about transformation um, just by like, walking with a group of disciples outside of your ethnicity, but who are like also rooted in the love of the Lord and the Eucharist and, and, and our, um, and the, and the church's teachings. There was a, a principal in my diocese, um, Dr. Ellen Lee, she's a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, and an event happened where one of her students at her school wrote a terrible letter about African-Americans saying that she thought that, um, that they should still be slaves and they were all thugs. And it was just a stupid letter. Well, her classmates took a picture of her letter, put it on social media. It went viral. So at this point, the news is on top of this. So I'm the co-chair for our commission on racial harmony. I was invited to go um, give a talk to the principal and her, her, her faculty and staff to help them to discern well, what do we do with this situation? And so the first thing I did was I went to go spend time with Jesus in the Adoration Chapel because before I give difficult conversations, I always ask him to give me the gift of tongues. Um, so that I can only say that what she wants me to say. And I asked him to give the audience the gift of interpretation of tongues so that they will only hear that which he wants them to hear for their sanctification. So I'm That's in the chapel. Oh, dude, say. yeah, That's use it anytime. Um, so uh, I'm in the chapel with the Lord and I'm, I'm looking at the artwork and the statues. And oh man, I'm like, man, look at this. Like, uh, like Jesus is white, which is fine. Jesus can be white. And when he appears in apparitions, he appears like the people he appears to. Um, Mary was white. Um, Joseph was white and St. Michael was white. Um, and, and, and the only dark image I can remember was of Satan, you know, like, oh man, like what's, what's going on with, with this particular, yeah. they don't have that statue anymore. But 
I say, oh man, like this. And then I walk through the hallways and it's like white statue, white painting, white artwork, white this. And it's a very diverse school. It's like, man, like, I wonder if they noticed this. And so the first thing I did with them was I gave them an experiment. I said, imagine if, if you went to a, a church, you were invited to a church called St. Charles Luanga, whose feast day it is today. Um, and, and you were, you were white and your, it was, your friends were black and you walked in the church and God was black. And Mary was black and Jesus is black and all the angels and saints were black. And the only white image was of Satan. And you asked the question like, hey, like maybe we could like add a few white angels and a few white saints in here too. I mean, the body of Christ is very diverse. And people said, yeah, you know what? No, that's just the way it is. That's just the way right. it is. This is the way it's always been. The, the black angels and saints and the black image of God represents everybody. So you should get, get used to it. So it brought to their attention. So what she did immediately after that was the principal when because she wasn't aware she she got paintings of mary all these different images of mary our lady of cabello our lady of guadalupe our lady of akita our lady of la vang our lady of lords our lady of fatima all these different beautiful images of, of our lady of different ethnicities as she's appeared over the world to go throughout her entire school so every student can see an image of mary that looks like them I then asked them um, uh, uh, about uh, their, their, their policies. And I said, like, what's in your handbook? And so the principal brought to my attention that what she did was she invited African-American students to sit at the table with her to ask them and their moms and dads to read the policy with her so that she could see this policy through their lens. And yeah. what she came to find out was there were rules in her handbook that were getting her students suspended, the black students, because the, the rule in the handbook was you could not wear braids. Now, as African-American women for hundreds of years have braided their hair, right? So it's that you have the option. You can, you can have a, a fro, you can have braids, um, you, can, you can perm your hair. You, I mean, there's different things you could do, but like if you perm your hair, you could damage it. And so it's like, why must I make my hair look European to come to this school? You know, like why can't I do what's natural? And so once she found out, when she heard them say this, that they were hurting because of this, this policy in the handbook that she had no idea existed, you know what she did? She rewrote the policy with them at the table and made it a just policy and made it inviting so that they would feel welcome in the school and have an opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament um, at Mass in the Scriptures and become disciples of Jesus Christ. Sister Thea Bowman became a nun after receiving a Catholic education as a Protestant um, African-American. Um, and so we have an opportunity to draw people into our Catholic schools um, if we address some of these policies that we maybe it was written by somebody who was trying to keep blacks out probably not but regardless the, the bottom line was is it was keeping many black people away because they were tired of getting reprimanded and detention and suspended for for their hair um yeah. we went through a number of other things as well but it was so beautiful how um, oh the prayer they 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 were praying generic prayers over the intercom when they were going through the situation where the school was struggling with a lot of racial division because of this letter. So I invited them, why don't y'all pray a prayer for racial harmony? And so every Friday they began to pray a prayer for racial harmony. Um, so again, all these changes happened within one conversation. And so I think sometimes we, we feel like, what can I do? It's such, such a big thing. It's like, all you have to do literally is like listen to other people, invite other people to sit at the table with you a befriend other people, a grown relationship intentionally with them through like Bible studies and stuff like that. And then from those relationships, we will be able, like the more I get to know you, Father Mike, the more I'm going to open my heart to you. And I'm going to share right. things that I struggle with that I wouldn't share if we were just on the surface with each other. And so if we can imitate Jesus and really invest our entire lives with each other, then we'll be able to hear what is going on and how we can work with those people to bring about a change in, again, the practices like Archbishop Hughes did with the country club um, and the policies like what Dr. Ellen Lee did at St. Michael's High School. And so I think one of the things that keeps going back is we're going to go to Q&A in, in a bit because people <laughs> have been putting some some questions, but this is so good. Um, one is, again, uh, surrender, right? Listen to learn. Um, to have that shape our, 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 our lens of like what we can see. Um, I, I think at the, another thing that comes keeps coming back is uh, maybe to say to not stop saying specifically racism to, to not just say, cause here's, again, I, we talked about this, but I kind of default sometimes like, okay, like you said, the generic terms, here's the generic prayers they were praying at the inner over the intercom to be able to say, no, let's name some of these wounds so that yeah. we can uh, speak the name of Jesus over the names mm -hmm. of these wounds. Yeah. And maybe not be afraid to like step in it, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, um, or, or say, and, and, and we might say the wrong thing and that's okay. Right. Like we might say the wrong thing, we might offend somebody, but I would rather try. 
I would yeah. rather like walk out on the water. Like I think Jeff said yesterday, he was like, we've got now's the time where the spirit of God is inviting us to walk out on the waters and just to yeah. keep our eyes on Jesus. And like, if I, if I mess up, I can repent. I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to, to like, I'm trying to make things right and bring about authentic reconciliation in the body of Christ because that's what Jesus wants. He cried out for that in John 17. And I believe in the depths of my heart, we have not responded well to the desire of Jesus for unity. So just try. Yeah. You see, and, that, and that's and that's one of the questions that had come in, which is that um, what someone asked, uh, named Corliss had asked, what are our favorite verses when it comes to that mm. important place in our hearts? Again, and not just like, here's my favorite verse for this, but like, that the Lord has really spoken to us in this time. Um, yeah. For me, I know like so, so clearly um, was J the letter of James. I was praying daytime prayer last mm. week, I think, and it was be quick to listen or quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. Um, and, and that's what he's mentioned, the two ears, one mouth kind of situation. Mm. For me, it was like, no, I just need to listen. I just, I need, I need to listen and sur I can go back to the surrender because that's been like been the, what the Lord has placed on me. So be qu uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, that's been one of the verses that's been fun. Mm. I mean, how, about, how about you? I mean, yeah. So I was John, John 17. I've been in the ag in the garden lately, but, um, the, I'll tell you why. And then I'll tell you the St. Paul verse. Uh, I'm, I'm like Michelle Benzinger and Biden together. I always have like two or three things. Um, so where I've been at my prayer lately, just even before the George Floyd, before Ahmaud Arbery, um, it's been uh, the Agony Garden. I have just been accompanying Jesus there and, and perceiving the heart of Jesus, sorrowful uh, and, and just aware that like, man, like when Jesus Christ was sorrowful unto death, the apostles who were near him and around him were clueless. And I really think that uh, I'm not trying to sound offensive, but I really think that there are disciples of Jesus Christ who can be clueless to the reality of the suffering of other members of the body of Christ, because the apostles did, just didn't lean in and say, Jesus, Hey man, like, you look different today. Like what's going on right now? Like you, your, your, your disposition has changed within the past three hours. What's going on, Jesus? Like they, they chose to sleep and focus on themselves more than they did Christ. And so that's one scripture passage, but the other one is St. Paul, because St. Paul writes in Corinthians that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And I, and the eye can't say, to, I can't uh, to the ear. I don't need you. Like we can't, I need you father Mike and you need me because we are necessary members of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we all need each other in order to not only survive, but to thrive in the body of Christ and to bring about healing and restoration, renewal, um, repentance, reparation and reconciliation. We all need each other. We are all necessary members. So like um, there might be times where we could be tempted by the enemy, the devil to be like, I don't need that member of the body of Christ. Um, but I can't say that. Like, I need yeah. you. I might not like everything about you right now but I need you. Um, and I have to lean into relationship with you. Uh, and I think that that's where the Lord is trying to like bring all of us together. It's like that person over there is the body of Christ. And you really are the body. Like when the father, when God, the father sees you, God, the father delights in you. He knows you're broken. He knows you've made mistakes. Um, he knows you're wounded, but the father delights in you and he sees you, knows you and loves you through and through because you are the body of Christ. Like that's who you are. That's your core identity by virtue of your baptism. And so, whenever we can receive that love from the father in prayer, we can then look at our, our neighbors and say, I see you and I delight in you and I love you and I need you. And I need your help. I need your charisms. I need your wisdom. I need your prayers and your fasting. I need to walk with you so that together, uh, together we can build God's kingdom and his way will in time. And, and our civilization can become known as a civilization of love um, and not what it is currently known for in this country. And then two things on what you just said. One is when it came to like them not being there. Hey, Jesus, you're having a rough day. <laughs> I can tell something's going on. I, it's I, I, another kind of element of this Judas. I reflect on this all the time. Like, how did, how come no one asked Judas? Like, like here's, here's that one piece is mm. like, Judas goes off. remember he goes off into the night and they just assume what he was about to do. They just assumed it was, you know, because Jesus said, give some money to the poor or do such and such. And they just assumed he was fine. They just assumed that yeah. well, he's, I'm sure he's fine. And and there are how many people are around us that I just assume you're fine. And I think about this when it comes to my students of color, the people in my parish who are um, whatever background, whatever and that ethnicity, our black students, our Hispanic students, our native students. And I'm like, oh, and you're, and here's, again, my default is 
you love Jesus, you know Jesus. Um, I just don't imagine that this is an issue for you because I know mm. you, you know your identity, ident sorry, identity yeah. is as a son of God or a daughter of God. And so again, my lens would be, mm. and so I'm like, here I am being the actual Judas essentially, right? Mm. But just assuming that, well, if this was an issue you would tell me as opposed to being able to yeah. talk to the people that I, hopefully they trust me now and hopefully they know I love them and hopefully I actually do love them to be able to say, how is this right now um, yeah. when it comes to everything, but specifically we're talking about racism mm -hmm. when it comes to that, to be able to name it and say, how are you? And this is how like, right. We could probably do this with everybody because so how many people do you and I do this? Well, maybe are tempted to do it. I just assume you're fine. I, I get you yeah. probably fine. Um, but you also had had um, in your podcast in last night with Jeff, you had talked about when it comes to the body of Christ and a prayer mm -hmm. that you have when it comes to, is it the, uh, the litany of the body of Christ. Litany of the body of Christ. And could you mm. share here too? Because it's just so powerful that I think that if more yeah. of us do this, it's it's that step toward those steps towards healing where we're like, I'm powerless. What can I do? Like I'm only one human being. Yeah, man. So I was in prayer with the Eucharist and I just perceived like the Holy Spirit infused this prayer into me. And again, I use the word perceive because I'm not I'm not infallible and it could be wrong, but um, I'm grateful for that. I've been seeing some fruit from it um, of the past few days. So I'm grateful for that. But basically it's where we will like put someone else's name, um, insert name, whoever name is and say, is the body of Christ. It, so like George Floyd is the body of Christ. George Floyd is the body of Christ. Because if our prayer will affect um, what we believe, the way we pray affects how we believe and what we believe will, um, will inspire our actions. You know, so like we, we, when we pray at, at the mass and we, we consecrate the host, our, our people are on their knees and, and they're reverent because they, their, their prayers inspire them to really believe this is Jesus. And because they believe it's Jesus, they act as if it's Jesus. They don't just go about receiving communion any kind of regular way. Right. Um, so the same thing would apply for, for this. If I can really begin to pray like Father Mike Schmitz is the body of Christ, then the way I speak about you, the way I think about you, the way I listen to you, the way I look at you, the way I want to help you and accompany you. If I hear that the body of Christ is being oppressed by a person or by a place or by an institutional practice or policy or whatever it might be, I'm going to want to console your heart because you're the body of Christ. And so I encourage people, especially when it comes to the racial divide, because there are members of the body of Christ who do struggle with um, being raised to grow up to believe uh, uh, prejudice, feeling thoughts about people and to discriminate against people. It's to if you're black and you struggle with white people, then insert white name, you know, like George Bush is the body of Christ. George Bush is the body of Christ over and over again. If you're white and you struggle with a black person, then you do Barack Obama is the body of Christ. Barack Obama is the body of Christ. And, and it, or depending on wherever you're at, whoever you're struggling with in, in that time, it, it really can affect the way that we see our brothers and sisters. Like I recognize like you're the body of Christ and I'm the body of Christ. Therefore, I've got to reverence you and, and do everything I can to be in a relationship with you. Because if we reject the body of Christ on earth, you know, the, the Bible is very clear. How can we say we love a God who we can't see if we don't love our brothers and sisters who we can see? And so if I'm rejecting my brothers and sisters who are made in the image of God, who are the body of Christ on earth, then I'm pretty sure I'm setting myself up to not be in a relationship with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. Well, that makes sense too. Is that, I mean, I remember hearing stories of St. Francis of Assisi, who, when he was in front of a newly baptized person, he would genuflect mm -hmm. uh, when he saw like the newly baptized baby or the newly baptized adult. And he just, that, that, cause Imagine, this is, yeah. yeah, this is the, mm -hmm. the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the, the, the indwelling of the, of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell within this person. Like, and, the, wow. and to let it like change the way we interact. So one of the things I'm hearing too, that like, how do we, because again, I, I come back to this. I imagine a lot of people who are watching this uh, are also saying like, well, I'm one person, you know, I'm a, what do I do? Especially like, how about this? In face of um, things that are out of my control, for example, there are thousands and thousands of peaceful protesters. Mm -hmm who are exercising not only their right, but also exercising, I would say probably duty, right? Mm -hmm. We have to do something and to Mar stand up. I, to I go to the March for Life every year. That's a, the March for Life uh, in January is a protest that I, I don't know if you go to, but I for years I've gone to it and I protested abortion for unborn babies and for their mothers. And so um, protesting is something that disciples of Jesus Christ have done for a very long time. Yeah. And then, and then um, 
I, I think, you see, for me, in my, in me again, my perspective is is very clear difference between protesters and rioters, right? It's very it's clear a difference between protesters and looters. Um, yeah. And I don't know, would you want to speak into, uh, like, I don't know, for again, your average person who's just like, I, I, this is evil, but so is yeah. rioting. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, what do I say? What do I do? Okay, two things. One, I'll just, I'll be vulnerable and express an ache of my heart. Uh, so, um, this is not like George Floyd is not the first black person to be killed, right. um, not even on camera. Um, and, but what's, I guess what's, what's disheartening is that it, it, it appears, it, and I could be wrong. I, so again, I'm open to being wrong. And if I am wrong, I repent for being wrong for making this assumption. But there's been so many times where a black person has been killed on camera and, um, and black people have cried out. Um, but we have not seen other disciples of Jesus Christ of, of, other, of other races speak out as well. And it seems that because the riots began to happen um, and people began to, to say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Like our buildings are being destroyed. And uh, again, it, it wasn't the peaceful protesters who were destroying buildings. It was, right. it was other people who came to take advantage of, of George Floyd's death. Um, but it seems like that's whenever people started acknowledging, oh yeah, it's, it's messed up that George Floyd was killed, but this is also evil. And it's like, yeah, of course that's evil. Like we've always said like, you, you should never do that. But why is it that we're not focusing? I, like, I really believe that the devil distracts us a lot and the yeah. devil is trying to like, like he comes to like distract us all the time from what God is doing. And I believe that like when George Floyd, that member of the body of Christ, the man who was made in the image of God was, was killed, um, all of a sudden, the the attention was taken off of him, and it was put on the these evil these evil riots. The like riots are evil; they're they're demonic, they're chaotic. That's 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 the mark of Satan, right? Um, but all of a sudden, we're looking at that now, and we're not sitting with the reality oh, that many yeah. of us just witnessed on film, on camera, a human being get killed for nine minutes. We need to like grieve that. We need to take that to the Lord. That was the body of Christ who, who called out for his mom. Like Jesus, when he was on the cross, he, he Jesus couldn't breathe. And Jesus called out for his mother when he was on the cross. Like, that's something to lean into. And I perceive that the enemy was just like, let me just take everyone's attention off of that person who is the body of Christ and focus on everything else right now, which again, we need to speak out against writing, which I believe we, we've done already. Um, but, but, uh, we, we should not not focus on like let's let's stay focused on this this killing and let's stay focused on what has um what are what are some policies that might be in place that might allow and i, I think you know my dad's uh my dad was a law officer he was the captain of the baton Rouge police department my dad was shot point blank in the head i grew up wondering if my dad was going to come home after he would work he would come home super late sometimes and i would stay up all night waiting for my dad to come home thinking I'm going to get the news that he's dead. Like I'm, he, my dad's dead. I just know he's dead. So I, I get what it's growing like, up with all, like a, a member of the law enforcement. I've worked with cops as a priest, but there, and my dad would say this, my dad himself, who's the captain of police would say this, that, that there happens to be quite often at times, um, policies in place that protect, um, crooked officers and that they, they get away with things time and time again, and they get reprimanded and nothing happens. And that was the case with Derek Chauvin. He was reprimanded so many times before he killed George Floyd, that if there was a law in place to stop people like him from being able to continue to be a member of the law enforcement, then that death would have never happened. And right. so if we, if we sit with that, then we could say, how can we pray more to this and work to like change this, this, this system that has perpetuated, um, bad cops being able to get away with, with things time and time again until they kill somebody, you know? Um, so yeah, of course, writing is evil. It's, a, it's of the enemy. We pray against it. St. Michael prayer is a powerful prayer to pray. Rosaries are a powerful prayer to pray. But I would say while we pray those prayers and while we encourage our brothers and sisters to have conversions, to not go out and steal and destroy property, it's also really important to, to not be so distracted from this human being whose life was taken from us on camera. Our like, brother. Yeah, to that, like not only distraction, but division, right? Mm -hmm. Because now, um, not only am I distracted by the new thing, the new uh, crisis, you know, of, of, which again, we're all in agreement in some ways. No, I think we're all in agreement that, yeah, rioting's bad, difference between protesters and rioters. Yeah. And what happens is like, now I need to go to social media and I need to now say, well, this was bad, but this is bad too. Like, right, but yeah. as, if, as if we're not in agreement, like, yeah. I mean, it takes away again, division now, not just distraction, division and now we're fighting by well you didn't give enough attention to the writing because you're still focused on george floyd like well, no like 
can't we in some ways just like say, let's, let's talk about truly what unites us. And I think yeah. as, as believers, as followers of Christ, disciples of Jesus, that we believe like, no, we can walk and chew gum. Like we, yeah. <laughs> these, the, cat, the Catholic both end. Yeah. And, and there's something about that that I just think is if we, if we miss now, two quick things, uh, if you don't mind, I have one question of my own. And then, but there is a guy, Jeremiah had asked the question. He said, what advice would you give an African American young man considering the priesthood? And, uh, since um, I was in seminary and I am now a priest, but, um, Father Josh, maybe this is your question. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would, I would say is make sure that you're prioritizing the interior life, fall in love with Jesus, yeah. like fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, spend time with Jesus Christ, because the only way that we can, can really discern a voc- any kind of state of life vocation, any vocation, but a state of life vocation, particularly is if we're listening to the voice of Jesus. So mother Teresa many years ago said to her sisters, I'm worried about some of you that you don't know Jesus. So I would encourage you to make sure that you are prioritizing time apart so that you can get to know Jesus's voice, see his face and hear him speak his words of truth to you, because only the grace of God will sustain any of us in our vocations. And the only way that we will be able to persevere, not only in discernment, but also if you become a priest, is if you are rooted in the interior life and have a a living, vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, I would also encourage you to to reach out to other um, a black priests. One of the things that was so helpful for me when I went to seminary, I was one of the few black seminarians. Um, I had no black professors, no black uh, spiritual directors. Um, and it wasn't until my seventh year of seminary formation that I had an African-American priest who was a, a, a teacher at the seminary. There's one African and then now there's an African-American. And it was it was crazy. We went out to dinner one night and all of a sudden I share with him things that had happened in seminary, things that some of the, my brother seminarians had said to me, um, racial prejudice, racial, like all that stuff that I'd kept inside. For, I, my spirit director didn't even know about it. And yeah the floodgates open. And so it was so helpful for me to finally find um, a, a, a person of color who was like, I get it, Josh, the same thing happened to me. So I'd also encourage you to find other um, other people of color who are in the priesthood or in religious life who can just support you in your vocation. Um, because again, sometimes our brothers and sisters who um, have an experience that we've gone through might not know. And, and it might be... And, and, it might be taxing to always have to explain things to people. And so, um, so I, I would say, yeah, so, so community fellowship, uh, prayer and follow with Jesus. And then, um, and then desire salvation, you know, <laughs> yeah. desire salvation for yourself and for the world. And, and then the Lord will provide whatever you need. So that's kind of what I think I would say. That's really good. I, I, um, and then that, that, this is, it's one of those things that like, I'm like, oh my gosh, no, seriously. Like you got that from even brothers in the seminary. Oh dude. Yeah. One time I almost like, so talk about like demonic. So I, uh, my first year of seminary. So again, fresh out of seminary, I, I mean, I had a conversion at Steubenville South and I was like, so I was, I wasn't like super tame like I am now. And so <laughs> dude like stepped at me inappropriately and, and called me the N word. And yeah, in seminary and he left formation by the way. So he's not a priest. Um, uh, but it was about to get really bad. Like it was, it took a lot for me to say again, praise God. I've, I've been like, I've had room to grow. There's better ways than violence, right? Like when Peter saw that Jesus was being attacked, Peter went to the sword, you know, and Jesus said, don't go to the sword, Peter, right? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So fraternal correction can happen without violence, but man, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, I can ima- I can't I can't imagine. I can't cuz you like this is the last place I would expect anyone to do this. Now, um there's a two-ish I said one, but okay. Um you know, I I, I sometimes find people online saying things. There's one of the questions too. Uh when it comes to, like Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. uh, uh sometimes people say, "Well, that is are they too like bent on it seems angry." Well, I'm like, "Well, man, you you, you told us, you know, said, "Hey, watch 13th." Uh mm-hmm. not, not, I did, not, yeah. We have Netflix. And I'm halfway into it, but like, it's like, it's like one of those things that you, you see the photographs of the Holocaust, you see photographs of concentration camps and you're like, wow, this is now real. These are human beings who are treated like animals. And in this documentary, the 13th, um, as I'm watching it, like there's actual footage, there's actual photographs, um, of, of human beings in our country being treated like animals. Um, and so it's like, wow, this is very powerful. So if someone says, well, Black Lives Matter seems angry, like, well, yeah, I mean that makes sense. Um, there, there's a just anger, right? They're like so, like biblically, yeah. Jesus Christ had a just anger whenever he flipped the tables, right? So whenever, so I think anger is not a sin. It's when it becomes like wrath. When it becomes, I want to in, do something to hurt you or whatever. But I, and I before I'm, I'm gonna let you finish. But I, I just real quick, ADD. I think you're. Are you kind of ADD too? Like me? I don't know. I am. Up around. You know? Okay. So I was in 
Poland uh, at, at, the, at the concentration camps. And I remember like that, that feeling of oppression and, um, yeah. and, and I was with a bunch of beautiful disciples of Jesus who were also like feeling it too. But it, what, what struck me was that um, I've been to many plantations over the years and, and I've, I've, I've never heard people describe the, the kind of pain that they felt when they went to Poland and saw the concentration camps when they've gone to plantations. And they're like, oh, the plantation is really pretty. But it's like you do realize like this is a place where men and women were raped by their masters and they were beaten and their families were separated and they were killed and they were slaughtered and they were hung and they were they were treated like dirt and they were abused on a daily basis. Like this is a place where like racial terrorism happened. It's not something that I, I, I think that it would be nice if if we could begin to like look at plantation labor camps the same way we look at the Holocaust. Because right. similar things happened, you know, it, it was it, people made the image of God were violated in in ways that that you know were were mortal sins. Um, so, sorry, I just have to say that. No, that's it though, because I think it, if we keep it away from ourselves, and I think again, this is this comes to the point of like, okay, I need to open my eyes. The reason why we have some of those, you know, uh, pro life murals or you know p images that depict here's the reality of what happens in. Yeah is the same kind of thing to be able to say, okay, here's what happens when um, uh, when racism is allowed to unfettered reign. And I think there's something in this, you know, T.D. Jakes, he had, he had talked about this. He said, he said, yeah, all lives matter. Cause that's our response, right? A lot of people who are like, well, no, no, no. Um, Black lives matter. Of course they do, but so do all lives. All lives matter. And he had a, he had a good point. He said, well, yes, all lives matter. But in this case, we're talking about one guy. His name is George Floyd. Yeah. And I thought like, oh, that is, that is it. Because it is true. All lives matter. It is true. Black lives matter. It is true that George Floyd's life And we matters. should be able to make the distinction, Father Mike, make the distinction between even the movement Black Lives Matter and like the, fa the founders, what they believed about like all these different tenets and being able to say, no, like I as a Christian, I as a Catholic can say that like right now, black lives have not been valued. And so, yes, I can say black lives matter and not be associating myself with everything that this particular right. movement stands for. Um, a there's a difference between a hashtag and, and an ascent to a particular movement. And I think sometimes people think because you say, no, this black life matters, that all of a sudden you're saying, I therefore agree with every single tenet of the, the, the three founders of black lives matter movement. That's, that's not what you're saying. You're just saying that we have we have not regarded well for hundreds of years this life. And now, now we want to say, we want to prioritize, we want to have a preferential option for you right now, like Jesus would. That's really, does. I think I think for the last thing, I, don't want, I know what people are kind of looking for a lot of times when they come to this, or maybe they're waiting for it, is, um, okay, so I'm not in charge of any institutions. I'm not in charge of any culture. I'm not in charge of policy uh, or practices, but there's that sense of like, but I'm in charge of me in some ways, or I'm under his lordship, under the Lord's lordship, but you know what I'm saying? I, mm -hmm. I'm responsible for me. And and the question that you know comes back to me all the time is, okay, I want to take personal responsibility. Um, and is it enough for me just to say, well, I'm not racist, so there you go. I'm taking personal responsibility. I've literally never said anything racist. I've never said a racist joke. You know, Of course, I'm exempting myself. I remember yeah. hearing someone say, uh, the question is not, are you racist? It's the question is, in what way does racism exist in your life? Or, you know, yeah. sexist? well, in what way are this, you know, um, but you had really spoken powerfully, I believe, um, on the response as for, from us as Catholic Christians who take yeah. personal responsibility, but we also have this crazy and corporate responsibility. If we're parts of the body of Christ, yes, one member suffers, we all suffer. We all suffer. Yeah. One member is strong, we all grow in strength. And there's this kind of a political word, I guess you could say, uh, reparations. And people mm -hmm. right, they, they debate making reparations to ancestors of those who have been slaves, those who have been uh, the descendants of those who have suffered under Jim Crow. And so we can debate reparations, but Catholic speaking, you have something powerful to say when it comes to like, I don't have to wait yeah. for the government to say this is good or bad. I don't have to wait for our culture to say this is good. Or, I mean, like reparations be good or bad. Our church says we are actually demanded to make reparations for our own sins. Yeah. And we're invited by the Lord Jesus to make reparations for each other. So when I, again, just kind yeah. of- So, I mean, let, let's just, let's rephrase this conversation to the pre-sex yeah. scandal that um, has yeah. happened in our country. Like, around the world, but in this country, you and I have never touched little boys, little girls. We've never done that. However, because we're priests, 
um, we took on that. And we not only prayed for the victims and we not only led our churches in prayer services and offered up masses for this intention and led holy hours of reparation for the sins of our past priests who preceded us, who have hurt our people, who many of whom have passed away. But like we we still took that on. Right. We still said we're going to we're going to take this on as our responsibility. Uh, my bishop came into my diocese and he began to um, give money to victims and offer free counseling and all, all, all this stuff that he's not from this diocese. He's from Texas. Yet he took on that and began to p- give them something that he didn't do. We didn't do, but we took it on because we are members of one body of Christ. And so I'm responsible for you and you're responsible for me. And so um, as a priest, you and I, when someone comes to confession for us, they repent first and foremost. Um, but then they also have to do a penance. But then you and I also, we begin right. to do penances for them. We didn't, I didn't commit their sin, right? I certainly, some of their sins, I'm like, I would never do. I, I used to always say, look, you could say anything I've done at all. <laughs> and then I started hearing stuff. I was like, well, I ain't done that now. <laughs> you know what? Never mind. <laughs> but we do penances for people. Like I take on penances for my people all the time that I've never done. And this is a biblical thing. There cannot be reconciliation, which is what God wants, unless yeah. there is repentance and reparation so biblically speaking uh, if you look in the new testament zacchaeus zacchaeus uh, was a tax collector he stole from a lot of people he hurt people and then jesus christ invited him into a relationship um, with the lord and zacchaeus not only repented of what he'd done but he also he had to repair the damage he did with the community and he had to make it right so he paid them back everything that he owed them so he paid them back and so the same thing applies for us is that we can make repentance on behalf of other people in numbers we're, we're told we, we have to make a repentance but if you look at the prophets ezra and daniel they repent not only for their sins and their mistakes but they do it for their fathers and their grandfathers they do it for their people for their land and so we've got to begin to say i can do penance and i can repent not only for what i have or have not done but i can do this for other members of the body of christ by adding extra rosaries by fasting from meals by fasting from speaking by adding extra holy hours um by doing the stations of the cross uh by by, by taking on different acts by also trying to make it right by like looking into um specifically like the, the school system like our catholic schools and saying like is it right that that our, our school system doesn't address slavery and Jim Crow the way it actually was? Uh, I can use my influence to to change the curriculum, to make sure that our kids are brought up knowing the reality. Um, is it right that our, our schools um, don't have artwork, our churches don't have artwork that depicts the entire body of Christ? I can make it right, like make it by by. by bringing that to the table what years ago i went on a retreat with one of of my best friends in the priesthood um uh, and whenever we left the retreat i was driving his mom's car and this is like back in 2010 before like backup cameras were normal uh the, the, the norm and so like i was like looking the backup camera she had that and i was like oh my gosh this is so cool like i can see the car behind me and i didn't realize that like i was super close to the car behind me and i i literally like ran into it and like totally messed up that car and my buddy's mom's car. And so uh, I was, I was a seminary. He was a priest. So anyways, long story short, the guy came out, he was not of Columbus. He felt bad for me. He was like, look, man, I know you're a seminary. You don't have money. I'll take care of mine, but I still had to pay for my buddy's mom's car. I still had to make that right. And so I told her, I'm sorry. And she said, look, Josh, like, it's cool. Like, like I forgive you, but we weren't reconciled. We had not reestablished mutual trust yet until I did what? Until I paid her back. Right. Until I paid her back what I what I owed her. So so we we do that not only for for ourselves. So if I never I never owned a slave, some people say to me, I didn't grow up there in Jim Crow. I, I never said the N word. I didn't participate in the in the country club that was exclusive based on race. But because we're members of the body of Christ, St. Paul says that we must make up for what is lacking and the suffering in the body of Christ. So I must make up for what's lacking by offering up penances and sufferings and sacrifices and reparation to bring about reconciliation with the entire community. Because guess what? Jesus Christ, who we worship, who we adore, who we abide in relationship with and are invited to imitate our thoughts, words, and actions. Jesus Christ took on our sins that he never committed. And if he did it, then he sets the model that I'm going to take on the sins of my grandparents and of my great grandparents and of your people of my, I'm going to take on those sins and I'm going to offer up penances so that there can be reconciliation. I want to make it right so that Jesus Christ can experience consolation in his heart. And he will only experience that whenever we imitate him and do what he did and take on stuff that we never did for the sake of the body of Christ being restored, renewed and reconciled. 
Amen. That's so good. I mean, it's so powerful, not only because it's, it gives me like, a, I, I have marching orders, right? I, I know what I can do. Um, I feel powerless. Again, I think so many people, good, you know, good, what, people. What is, good people who are, what, who is the, Mar Dr. King said, the most dangerous Ooh. people in America are the white moderates. moderates. Yeah, white moderates. <laughs> who, not, I'm not racist and I'm not anti-racist. I'm just like, okay with how things are to be able to, I think a lot of re reasons were kind of okay is because it's like, well, what do I, what am I going to do? You know? Um, but what you're saying is you have agency. Like we all have agency. We also have a commission mm -hmm. and that commission being brought into the body of Christ, being given the Holy spirit spirit. We've been given that co-mission with Jesus, which is redemptive suffering. Amen. That like, that, Amen. I so I don't have to get into the, the debates of political. No, this is not political. This is biblical. This is discipleship. Yeah. Discipleship. Yeah. And that sense of like, I see my brother suffering, my son, my sister suffering. I'm powerless. No, I'm not powerless because um, I can always suffer with them. And that redempt that suffering has been transformed in Jesus Christ. Oh gosh, Amen. that's so powerful because um, what does it also do? It not only A, gives me agency, B, I'm doing what Jesus commanded us to do, but C, it then reminds me constantly that I'm united, that this is not someone else's problem. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just, and that's just, man, so good. And I think that maybe that's, I don't know if it's a good place to land uh, for this conversation, but I think <laughs> that that's it is like, you know, for, for whatever it is, for wherever we're coming from that sense of, um, I have a niece who she posted something the other day that said something along these lines. She said, um, the opposite of compassion is not taking something personally because it just, because it doesn't personally affect you. Mm. <laughs> I was like, well, that's really wise. Mm. And as Christians, we must take each other's sufferings personally. Yeah, yeah. Because that yeah. Jesus did our sufferings personally. He does. Mm. Man, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for you, Father. Man, I'm grateful I, for you. I, Thanks for being my as friend. Father, <laughs> as a leader, and I'm so grateful for your words and your willingness. I know everyone's coming after you and saying, like, Father Josh, what do we I'm, do? I'm exhausted right now. <laughs> I've been praying for you a ton. Thank you know you. that. Uh, I am grateful, these, very grateful, yeah. Channel. In the, over the last 10 days, just lifting you up. And I know you're strengthened by other brothers and sisters too, but uh, thank you so much for your time. I knew you have a, a full rest of your night today. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. um, gosh, we have so confirmations. So pray for my, my students. Yeah. Uh, for the next three nights, we are doing confirmation, celebrating confirmation. And I'm so excited because, I mean, they're going to get to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit and go out and and, and know better how to share their charisms with the world to transform our society and to, again, uh, to do God's will and his way in his time and to build his civilization of love. So I'm so stoked for my kids tonight um, awesome. and the next three nights. To commission them and send them out and th th so the church won't be silent. Uh, the church hasn't always been silent, but some of us have been. Some and so that's mm -hmm. yeah. I love that with the speak with the speak in tongues and pray for the interpretation of tongues. So yeah. those can hear uh, that we can speak the words of God and people can hear the words of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Gosh, Father, would you just close us in a prayer and give everyone who's with us uh, love at this time a blessing? Yeah, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of this conversation, for the gift of um, our friendship, our priesthood, our brotherhood, for the gift of our church, for the gift of every single person who right now is is tuning into this conversation and joining us um, in this dialogue. Heavenly Father, I ask that you to send forth your Holy Spirit upon each and every single one of us um, and conform our hearts and our minds uh, to that of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can think think with the mind of Christ and, and feel with the heart of Christ and, and act with the body of Christ in our walk toward eternity. Blessed Mother, we entrust our walk toward eternity, our relationship with Jesus Christ to your maternal care, to your intercession, to your prayers of protection. Wrap each and every single one of us in your mantle of love. St. Joseph, terror of demons, wrap us in your cloak. And St. Michael, guard us with your shield and protect us from any unnecessary distractions, um, divisions, uh, attacks uh, fr from the enemy, any kind of temptations, suggestions from the enemy for us to not um, persevere in, in leaning into Jesus Christ in these times, specifically in his word and in the blessed sacrament so that we can um, imitate the one who we spend time with. Lord, we, we trust that, that adoration leads to imitation and we desire to imitate you right now. We desire to empty ourselves as St. Paul writes in Philippians, to empty ourselves so that other people for the sake of the bride, for the sake of the body, that we can lean into each member and accompany each member in the body of Christ um, towards finding freedom and healing and restoration and renewal and reconciliation. 
Lord, um, we just want to be saints. And so we, we entrust this entire um, conversation to you. May supernatural fruit come from this conversation. May intentional disciples be inspired to not be mediocre disciples of Jesus Christ, but to be radical disciples of Jesus Christ, who, who love the Lord so much that we are only about, about your will, about your will and your way and your time and our walk toward eternity. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. In the name of the, uh, ma'am, ma oh, I'm sorry. Man, my God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, whoa, I'm I'm exhausted. God bless you. Know, you. Go <laughs> oh gosh, praise God for hey. you. I'm so grateful for your friendship and thank you for your time today too. Hopefully, everyone who joined us today was blessed. Um, thank you for uh, checking us out, the Essential Presents channel. You have Father Josh. You have your podcast, Ask Father Josh. Um, we have the Essential Presents stuff. I have yeah. my Sunday Homily podcast. But uh, Father Josh, any last word do you want to just plug something uh for yourself or for ascension or what pe we can do as people of god or otherwise we're just going to end this live stream I, I i honestly i don't know man let's just let's just um let's just spend more time with with the lord yeah. um spend more time with let, let's just i pray all of us today will be a little bit more intentional and spend a little bit more time with the lord jesus christ prioritize him right if you if you if you watch this podcast today and this this interview um this conversation and you haven't spent time with jesus in prayer um, then now is the invitation from the Lord for you to spend as much time with him in prayer as you spent watching Father Mike and I have a discussion because I guarantee you the Holy Spirit has a lot more wiser words to share than we do. That's true. Adoration leads to imitation. That's Amen. awesome. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Shout Good out to the, the poor friars. <laughs> well, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Hopefully, again, this has been helpful. Um, one step forward, all those things that, that Father Josh has shared with us and we talked about, um, we just want to be like Jesus. Because that's what it is to be a Christian, is to become more and more like Christ. 